Welcome back and a happy new year to all our Mustang alumni and friends and anybody else who is uh, joining the show tonight from wherever in North America. You happen to be stationed during the third or fourth wave of the, the health crisis we're, we're currently in. Uh, Clark Singer, head coach of the Western men's hockey team here, very excited to uh, have our third uh, episode of the 2021-22 Hot Stove series tonight with uh, really an, an unbelievable uh, broadcaster, uh, one of the best in, in North America. I'm really, really pleased to introduce uh, back on the, the hot stove for the second year in a row, our only repeat guest. So the ratings for him last year must have been pretty good. Uh, Mr. Arash Madani from Sportsnet. Arash has been with Sportsnet uh, 13, 14 years now. Started in 2009 and covers a, a vast array of uh, amateur and professional sports for Sportsnet. He's covered some of the biggest sporting events in the world the last few years. World Series, um, Super Bowls, uh, Davis Cups, uh, NBA Finals, uh, just a whole host of, of different uh, events for Sportsnet. And uh, last year, I still remember some of his... Uh, Great stories and insight from the hot stove. So along with our host, Ryan Robinson, our uh, communications and uh, uh, director here at Western, we're happy to have uh, Arash Madani on the hot stove again here tonight. Welcome, Arash. Welcome back, Ryan. Hope everybody's doing well. Doing great, Clark. Thanks for the intro, man. I guess uh, if I'm a repeat offender, you guys are really, uh, you're, you're scraping the bottom of the barrel tonight. Well, I tell you, Rash, I, one of the story. I think this is the ninth episode of our hot stove series that Ryan and I have had over the last 18 months. And one of my most vivid memories slash stories was your story last year, uh, telling us a little bit about your experience with the Canadian national soccer team yes. in a qualifier in Central America. And I, Honduras. and I don't, yes, I don't think I will uh, uh, bring any more of that up, but I still remember uh, some of the shenanigans that happened down there. And uh, anyways, welcome to the hot stove. We look forward to another very uh, entertaining evening. Thank you very much. Good to be here. It's funny. A year ago, we were talking about Canada losing 8-1 to one in Honduras. And this year, our men's national team may end up qualifying for the World Cup for the first time since 1986. So as we've learned over the last couple of years, life comes at you fast. Exactly. As long as they keep playing on the frozen tundra of <laughs> yes. uh, Commonwealth Stadium and Tim Hortons Field, they should be okay. Yeah, January 30th, they'll be in Hamilton, so. <laughs> now, are, right, are, Clark, you, are you assigned that event? I hope so. I don't know. We don't know anything anymore because everything's locked down and shut down. So uh, even though it's an outdoor game, I don't know if there's going to be fans. I don't know how things are going to be covered. Like everybody else, we're in wait and see mode. Yes. So I'm in the process of like completely redoing my office. So that's why stuff's all over the place. No, well, that's great. Well, we're very happy to have you on board. And Ryan, thanks again for, for your time with us. Uh, look forward to that. Look forward to the next 45 minutes. Thanks so much, Clark. Keep an eye on that, uh, that chat window and uh, make sure to tell them, uh, get some good questions ready. Cause we know, uh, we know where Rash has got some stories and I have a feeling as per usual, I always say, I don't have all the questions. Uh, so I'm sure some, uh, some folks in the chat will have one. So I look forward to having you take care of that. And we'll talk to you at the end of, in, in, a, few, in a little bit. Now, Ryan, are we touching on politics at all tonight? Or are we sticking right to sports? Uh, I, I we will see uh, what kind of uh, what kind of beverage Mr. Madani has uh, in that glass over there, and we'll, uh, we'll 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 see there. I have the feeling the question of being elite may come up. Yes, at some point. yes. Um, maybe we'll wait for that one for a bit. Maybe we'll we'll wait for that one for a bit. <laughs> well, I have Thank you, Clark. Thanks, man. <laughs> Mr. Madani, nice to see you as always. I realize your day is going downhill. You start with Sid Sixero and you finish with me. I apologize. No, you're, you're all good. Uh, the beverage I had with Sid Sixero at 6.30 this morning on BT is a little different than the one I'm having tonight. So tonight's a win, Ryan. 
Uh, I noticed there is some, uh, obviously some Vikings purple in the background. Uh, I believe we may have to add a purple W back there somewhere. Is that, is that allowed in the, uh, in the Medani mm -hmm. office? I, I know that's a tough one because you've got that other purple that you like too. So this isn't what I'm having. And I don't know if the camera can pick this up. Um, this is, I went to school at Bishop's University and the yeah. Mighty Gators in 1998 won in the national championship in basketball. And they actually made a beer in commemoration of, of Bishop's. Uh, didn't play Western that year. I think we played Western the next year at the Nationals. So it's the BU purple in this in this house, Ryan. The, the <laughs> W, friend of the Mustangs, but, but Gator through and through. Yeah, uh, that, that that is it. purple purple pride, and we'll leave it at that. Is a, a, a common amongst both of us. Uh, uh, first things first, take us through because since obviously last time we talked there, uh, let's see, we, we're not going to get too political, but you went from going to cover things to not going to cover things to back to remotely covering things, and in between getting mocked in an L, in a hotel in Atlanta for wearing a mask. Right. Um, so, yeah, everything was shut down for a while. And um, we got back on the road end of August of last year. So back doing the Jays and, you know, kind of back at it through September and the pennant race and the playoff race. In October, I did playoff baseball. We were in Atlanta and L.A. and all over the place. Um, on Atlanta's run to the World Series. And I actually went to Europe twice to do tennis. Canada played uh, World Cup of Tennis Women, the Billie Jean King Cup, and on the men's side in the Davis Cup. And so everything was kind of back-ish to normal. You're still wearing a mask, and there's still some protocols, but, you you know, instead of an interview side-by-side, side, you're just two microphones a little bit apart. I did the Grey Cup in Hamilton. Everything seemed fine. And then, like everybody else, mid-December, um, it all shut down. But yeah, we're in Atlanta doing the NLCS and I'm just walking through the lobby of the hotel wearing a mask and literally was mocked. I was the only, I think I may have been the only person in the state of Georgia that day wearing a mask. But COVID in America is not a thing anymore, which I guess if you watch sports at all these days, um, we're reminded of that. What was the Winter Classic day the most kind of? And I know a lot of like it looked like in January second there was a lot of two NHL games happening at the same time, but one's obviously outdoor, one's indoor, but nobody and an entire filled baseball stadium in Minnesota. <laughs> yeah, wild, isn't it? You know, even just this week we were just talking about it. Monday night, the Alabama Georgia national championship game. There's eighty thousand people in Indianapolis. And last night's Raptor game, uh, the mascot got in trouble for getting in Devin Booker's face as the only fan, trying to distract him at the free throw line. Um, so it it's just wild seeing. It's just crazy, isn't it, Ryan? Two years in, mm -hmm. we're kind of. It feels like we're right back where we started, but here we are. I, are we getting closer to, or is obviously we're just kind of a scenario where you know. I, I know a lot of people have said, are we right back where we kind of started? Or does it feel like the, the runway is going to start coming here in a little bit? Because at least we're still seeing NHL games being played somewhat. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, it's better than it was. I mean, it's so hard to know what's next and, and to forecast. Uh, it was a bad sign when the NHLers first didn't go to Beijing when they announced they were pulling out of the Olympics. And, you know, the Olympics are still going to go. It looks like a, a friend of mine who's working for the Olympic uh, television broadcast services, um, he's, he's literally flying out tonight to Beijing. So it's it's going to go. But um, it's, it, it's just so hard to kind of forecast what's next. I mean, the Super Bowl is going to go. Um, how it's going to go, I think it's going to be, you know, all systems firing. But. Um, at this point, to try and forecast on Canadian soil what's going to happen, I think it's just a guessing game. Uh, the, the advantage of talking to someone such as yourself, uh, it's the the, the 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 plate is wide open, sort of thing. What uh, Clark actually asked this just before we came on, uh, and I think it might be of, of interest to the the group at large. But your role is obviously you mentioned it. We're doing the NLCS, then I'll go and do a tennis tournament, then I'll go and do the Grey Cup, sort of thing. How much do you enjoy that kind of uh, that kind of smorgasbord effect of 
and I know kind of talking to some of the you know friends that I have from over the years in the, the kind of broadcast and media side, that's kind of the enjoyment is when sometimes people enjoy that they aren't in the one lane at all times. It's kind of a I'm over here, I'm over here, I'm over here, I'm over here. It's not, nothing's no day is the same. Yeah, no days, and that's that's the thing I really enjoy. I love the variety. Uh, variety of sports, be it team sport or individual sports. Um, you know, some leagues have guaranteed contracts and some don't. Some players are just scraping by and some are living the high life. Um, and I find it really helps provide m me with an understanding, a better understanding when I go into different environments on what's, you know, what to ask people, what their, uh, what their perspectives are. And, and, you know, really broadens your, I remember when I was at Bishops, Jean Charest came and spoke to, um, spoke to the school about language. And he said, you know, here we are on this beautiful campus and right behind me, behind him was this, was this, you know, big window as far as the eye could see. But then on the left and the right was just a brick wall. He said, you know, when you look over my shoulder, you see this beautiful campus on a bright, sunny day, and you have this perspective of your campus. But you look to your right, you look to your left, it's just a wall. You have no idea what else is going on. He said, anytime you learn a new language, that brick wall turns into a glass window, and that brick wall turns into a glass window. And I thought that was a great kind of, uh, it provided me with a real understanding of it's not just one perspective to anything. So if I have a more of a perspective on an amateur athlete, on an Olympian, on an individual pro sports athlete, in team sports, in amateur team sports, in university sports, how they approach things, how they handle situations, how they may deal with a salary cap, where, how they approach the trade deadline, the way players think, the way coaches think, the way strength people think, front offices think, the more opportunity you get to kind of go down those roads and, and really gain more of an understanding and talking to the people involved, it turns a lot of those brick walls into windows and provides such a perspective and an understanding that helps me do my job better to then inform and, and provide a perspective to somebody who's watching and listening and following of, of what may be going on. And I really enjoy that part of it. And it, it really provides a challenge too. Has there been anybody in the last little bit? Cause the advantage is, as you said, you, you, you're hosting shows on, on, you know, whether it be TV or radio, uh, doing the, the reporting thing on the road. Uh, is the feature story the most enjoyable part of it? The, the longer version, the, the kind of, the, those kind of pieces sort of thing Do those, are those the ones that stick in your mind or is it the, or is it the game coverage or the you know the special event kind of scenario? I really enjoy doing the long form pieces. I really do. But as somebody who is a sports fan first, there is such a rush and a joy and a thrill and an excitement of being on the field or on the court or whatever, the ice. You know, they're about to drop the puck. They're about to have the first pitch. They're about to put the ball in the tee and kick off a championship game or a big playoff game or a big moment. And there you are at kind of 725 setting the scene for a 735 start to something. And the stadium's going nuts. There's an anticipation. There's an energy. And that's what makes sports so great. That's why, you know, as look, there's a lot of things happening in the world right now. But, you know, sport, well, I think what, one thing we've all learned in COVID between bubbles and empty arenas is that packed houses make sports it. And playing in front of nobody, it just doesn't have it. It just doesn't bring it. But when you have an entire arena or an entire stadium engaged on the moment, on the scene, on on what's happening there and living and dying on every single bounce and every single moment and every single chance that, that could happen. Uh, that's what it's all about. And, and to me, honestly, Ryan, like as much as I love the, the medium and all the different things, but I love the sit down interview and, and everything else being on the field, 
just before uh, that. That's an amazing rush, and that's a rush for me in a suit. I can I can't even imagine what it's like uh, for a player in that scene. What What's been the the events uh, even in that small window of time that you know you, you said you got to go a, a few places sort of thing. Um, you know, having seen the empty arena to maybe going to some of those those bigger venues sort of thing that, you know, had people again. Um, did it give it, it, it that extra emotion, that extra feel? It's a, I know for some people, they kind of say, oh, it's just, you know, another game. It's another event sort of thing. But does it add to the effect that you've gone to, you know, empty Scotiabank Arena and so on and so forth and then went to back to the, the full uh, the full house, whether that be in the States or somewhere else in the world? Yeah, no question. No question. Um, and I find it maybe it just seems this way because it had been a while, but the electricity was back. Like people were into it. And the first um, the first real moment it hit me was I did the um, Dodgers-Giants, the LA-San Francisco playoff series. And it was something like, a 109-win San Francisco team facing a 107-win Dodgers team in a best-of-five in an all-California series. And this rivalry is fierce. Like, think Red Sox-Yankees East Coast. It is just as fierce on the West Coast. And they this, this had been a series like 100 years in the making. Um, so it was amped up in there and it was i think a one or two run game and the deciding game in san fran and the dodgers bring out max scherzer to close the game mad crazy mad max (laughs) and when they won you know la is the defending champs but san francisco had the better season and what was awesome was the stadium went silent and all you heard was the Dodgers celebrating after. But the the anticipation for Game 5, the lead-up for Game 5, because it was Game 1 and 2 in San Fran, day off, travel. 3 and 4 in L.A., day off, travel. The anticipation on the travel date, and then all day leading into first pitch, and just talking to the players and being around it, and everybody knew what was on the line. Uh, the Dodgers lost. They were going to blow the whole thing up. And they ended up losing in the next round. Um, they blew the whole thing up. Um, it's it's great. It's really great. Was it the same? I know, obviously, Grey Cup was a little bit, you know, obviously, understandably different and less people than in, in California. But um, when Winnipeg wins, uh, th- that place was pretty empty pretty quick. <laughs> pretty quick. Pretty quick. <laughs> And you know what's interesting? Um, Winnipeg had gone 30 years without winning a championship, and they finally won it in 2019. And guys were overjoyed, and they, you know, they were partying like it was uh, like it was New Year's Eve, and they were just elated. This year, you know, and they they sat out the 2020 season, but this year. Um, The stage that was set up was in the end zone. And then once the trophy ceremony was done, all the family and friends kind of came out and hung out in the end zone. And yeah, there was happiness. There's no question. But I tell you what, there was just so much relief. There was so much of, man, we did it. We did it again. Like the the arrow was on our back all year. I think they started the year nine and one or something like that. Like the, the pressure continues to build when you're the defending champion. When everyone's coming after you, when you're wire to wire the best team, and somehow, some way, they won that game—a game they had no real business winning—and um, it was just kind of. Uh, um, so I thought that was really interesting to see just how quickly things can change. Win when you can. You never know when it's going to happen again. But uh, that was a big. That, that was my biggest takeaway um, from the Grey Cup was just how different. Um, the mindset, the attitude. They're bringing everybody back next year or as many other guys as they can to try and run it back one more time. But how difficult it is to win a championship, let alone to win two. I think uh, the, the the purple and white aspect of uh, punter Mark Leggio, we'll, we'll be happy to see him in, in blue and gold yet again. So, yeah, it's uh, funny after the game, actually. 
<laughs> he, he's, he's a good dude. So uh, good. We were we were happy to see him get that success. So uh, nice. he's got only like you know ninety thousand records around here for being a punter and a kicker. So um, he ran out of records to get. So we had to move on. So. Um, Speaking of obviously the, the the transition and being different, how much different is this Olympics going to be? Sort of thing. Obviously, there there are no NHL players there, and uh, are people going to get into it uh, as far as the hockey aspect? Do we, do we just assume we're Canadians? We're going to love hockey as long as somebody's wearing red and white, or is it going to be take that step down? Sort of thing. I think that people are going to get into the hockey, and it's going to be the women's hockey that they're going to get into again. Um, it's it's interesting because I, I was able to cover Sochi, and as much as it was, you know, Canada won gold and they beat Sweden on the final day of the Olympics, the best moment of the Sochi Olympics in my mind was Canada beating the U.S. in overtime of the women's game. Uh, the Americans led by a goal with a minute left in regulation. I can still see it. Kelly Stack and the Americans coming down the right wing, flipping the puck towards the empty Canadian net and it's just going towards the net. It's going towards the net, going towards the net. And it hit a piece of snow when it got started to slow down, hit a little bit of a piece of snow when it got to the crease and the puck kind of turned and slowed and came to a complete stop at the right post. And the Canadians cleared it out, came down, tied the game. Mary Philippe Poulin wins it in overtime. Canada wins the gold medal for the second straight Olympics. Uh, I don't know who Team Canada's men's team is going to be. I don't know who's on it. I don't know where they're going to find guys. Where you know, is it going to be some of the pros from Europe? Maybe some some more junior players. I know they've announced some, um, but I think with the time zone and I think with the lack of NHL players, um, it's not going to have the same cachet. Pyeongchang certainly didn't, and they're not going to. I don't think they're going to succeed, but we'll see. Uh, I think the women's team is really going to move the needle again. What I think is going to be really interesting about these Olympics overall is that a lot of Canadians really in Vancouver 2010, they really gravitated towards some of the stars of those games. But they're all gone now. They're all retired. Like we're 12 years removed from Vancouver. It's crazy. Um, Alex Bilodeau, who won the first Olympic gold ever on home soil, he's long gone. He's passed the torch to Mikhail Kingsbury. Um, Tessa and Scott in figure skating, they're gone. Patrick Chan in figure skating, he's gone. Speed skaters, other than Charles Hamlin, who's holding on, um, they're for the most part, they're all gone. So it's an altogether new generation of Olympians that we're going to get to know. And there was a lot of talk before Tokyo last summer of, um, <clears throat> you know, why are these Olympics happening and it's empty stadiums and no one really cares and the time zone's garbage? Fair. And then they lit the cauldron. And then there are some athletes out there wearing something with Canada and red and white and a maple leaf on it, and everybody got into it. And I think the same thing is going to happen this year. Um, even with the NHLers not there, even with the NHL that's going to continue to play in the month of February, there's something about an Olympics and there's something about being able to wave the flag a little bit and we get we get wrapped up in these athletes stories and I think that's what's going to be amazing about this year's is that the interesting aspect when you talked about the fact that there's been such a big push for obviously uh, you know the the professional women's game and the, the attention that they've been getting uh, rightfully so um, now to kind of have this plateau now to almost be, you know, the the team that, you know, the hockey team that everybody is going to be probably paying attention to as opposed to because people know the names of Mary Poulin and, uh, and you know, and the likes from the team sort of thing, Natalie Spooner, those kind of things. And they're becoming the household names that I think some people have been saying for years that these need to be the household names of just not just women's hockey players, but just these are household names for hockey players. And they're really good. And they're really good. When Golden and Gold in 14, silver in 18, and here they are again in 22 with a lot of that nucleus. And, you know, Sarah Nurse enters the mix and a bunch of new kids. Um, it's kind of like the women's soccer team. You knew Christine Sinclair 
Steph LaBay had been around for a while and Desiree Scott had been for a while, but then also comes this kind of new generation. But once you've identified the core group and that core nucleus and you feel like there's a connection to them, um, Sinclair's pro yeah, Sinclair's a bigger star nationally than Mary Philippe Poulain, but they're damn close. And uh, I think you just kind of, the combination of having a chance at gold, being really good, and also the fact that, man, could this really be another chance, another opportunity? And also, Ryan, there's nothing like Canadians beating the Americans in an international competition. That always, uh, that's always a good time, too. It light, lights the fire a little bit, and uh, yeah. no matter who it is, sort of thing. So, uh, hockey wise, um, NHL situation this year, who's been the surprise for you so far? Um, good question. Um, I, I mean, it probably has to be Montreal, you know, like I. I've mentioned this a couple times already, and I sincerely mean this. Win when you can, because you never know when you're going to get back at it. And, you know, there's always this thought of, okay, well, they got to the conference final, or they got to the Stanley Cup final, or the Super Bowl, and lost. Well, the next year, you got to start all over again. You don't pick up where you left off. Everyone's even at zero and zero. You know, Montreal hits lightning in a bottle. They they make the coaching change. Carey Price is stopping everything. Shea Weber's they they they're just they're just rolling along, and something kind of magical happens for a little while, and then the next season starts, and before you know it, the GM's fired, the goalie's gone away, the defenseman's career is probably toast, and now all hell is broken loose. So um, I don't think anybody expected the Habs to be a cup contender again but they're damn near rock bottom that <laughs> that, that happened quick uh Leafs Nation as per usual is it just uh is it literally now at the ever the point where everybody's going there's gonna have ups they're gonna have downs let's see when we get to April it's me up in April Kind of. Right. You know, it's kind of gotten to that point. And it's, um, it reminds me of when, this is going back a while, but when the Jays were really good in the 90s, it reminded me where Atlanta was. You know, Tom Glavin and John Smoltz and Greg Maddox and all, you know, Dion and all those guys were around. Terry Pendleton. Um, they're just winning the division year after year. It was like, okay, well, wake me up in October and let's see what they're going to do in the playoffs. Can they finally do it? And with the Leafs, it's that. And it's not win a championship. It's just win a round. Let's just start there, you know. Uh, they're really talented. They're getting really good goaltending from Jack Campbell, who's probably overachieving right now. Their decor is doing okay. Um, they're winning without Mitch Martin, who's doing the COVID thing right now. And Matthews is exceptionally good. But I don't think we're learning anything about the Leafs this month or next month. I think the only time we're really going to find out about the Leafs is the last two, three weeks of the regular season, how they go into the playoffs, where, you know, where they're at, and ultimately if they can do it. And they have to. Otherwise, um, this whole thing gets blown up. It has to. And, and from that aspect, obviously, with them being so close to, you know, salary caps and obviously trade deadline is still a piece away sort of thing. But there, there's even those that say, even though the trade deadline's coming, what what can you do sort of thing? Is it just kind of this is the group and we're going to see what happens? And then if it doesn't go the right way, then the adjustment gets made sort of thing? Because then it's like we tried long enough and now we have to do something. Yeah, I think they're they're trying to give themselves some cap wiggle room to do something if they can. Um, it's so weird because there's supposed to be a three week gap in February, and now suddenly there isn't. What we don't know going into any kind of deadline is what's the your injury situation one, 
how long, if you have one, how long term could it be? Because that could give you cap relief, but also it creates a hole that you need to address. So, you know, already Jake Allen tonight, the Habs hadn't played in 11 days. Right before I came on, I saw Jake Allen left the game and I just got a notification that he's not going to return. I think what we're going to end up seeing with all these COVID postponements and compressing this schedule, we're going to see a ton of injuries come uh, over the next little bit because these pl- – it's not about habit and routine. It's that these are human beings and they're not car engines. You can't just keep the car in the garage and – you can keep the car in the garage and go fly down the highway. You can't do that with players. And so what the ask of them is going to be is going to be huge, and I think it's going to lead to some injuries. So the way we kind of forecast what some of the needs may be now may not necessarily be that a week or so before the deadline. Uh, As far as adjustments and changes across the league, obviously the Edmonton Oilers situation continues to be brought up. There was obviously the talk yesterday of a a potential with Evander Kane now today the announcement of an investigation and that kind of taking a bit of a side uh you know a, a wait and see approach sort of thing but um you know is there change to happen in Edmonton or is it uh, or, or is it a, a, a different different situation there as well yeah I heard Connor McDavid today basically say if he can help us win let's bring him in and and you know I'm paraphrasing and he said we well, you know we have confidence in Ken Holland to to go do that um they need to do something. Uh, I don't understand what this investigation that the league is doing. It feels like the league has been coming, and Evander Kane hasn't done himself any favors, but it feels like the league has been coming after Evander Kane for a while. It feels like the Sharks have wanted to part ways with the contract as much as they've wanted to part ways with Kane. The fact that Kane has been so um, vocal about how poor the NHL has been when it comes to the diversity alliance and everything that's going on there, I think that weighs into it. I think now that the league and the teams are are partnering with gambling companies and there was the report and the accusation that Kane was gambling on games, I think any kind of sign of impropriety on that front really has the NHL um, on edge. So I think you kind of... Add all those things up, there's an apprehension that, you know, from some at league circles, but then there are teams saying, we want to win and he can help us win. And and I think that's something that Evander Kane, excuse me, um, talked about today. And, and this is this is pro sports. You know, uh, uh, Connor McDavid said the quiet part out loud today. We win at all costs. Off ice stuff be damned if he can come in here and get along well in the sandbox with others and, and help us and help us win. That's the pros. People some people like it and some people don't. Um, but that's the reality of what goes on. Um, so you can like it, you can not like it, but that's that's kind of how how the business of it operates. And is that obviously, you know, the 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 dry sidle and uh, and McDavid mentality of we came here, we want to win, and they know the kind of element and what kind of skill they bring to it, and they're kind of like, we know what we can bring. We just need the extra pieces now. Whatever we're doing isn't working. Mm. Let's go try and do something to to make this work. Um, look, Ryan, this is what I wonder. If the Oilers go down the tubes again in the first round this year, if the Leafs go down the tubes in the first round this year, how long, and let's remember the age of Connor McDavid and Austin Matthews and the era in which they're growing up in. Um, uh, The instant coffee, want results, want things my way, etc. How long the Twitter world? Get me the hell out of here. You know? Right now in the NBA, the players are running the show. Right now, Aaron Rodgers in football is trying to have player empowerment be a bigger thing. Russell Wilson's trying to make player empowerment be a bigger thing. 
how long before one of those two guys, if, if what's the definition of insanity, doing the same thing over and over again, expecting a different result, um, how long before they say, yeah, we're, we're done with this? I don't know. I wonder. Uh, as always, we will welcome everyone's uh, additional questions for Arash, and a couple have come in so far, and a couple of particular interest. And the first one, Arash, I, I, I have a feeling you'll have an automatic reaction to. From your perspective on the window of sports, what will be the ripple effect of the decision on Novak Djokovic playing slash not playing in Australia? This has been the story of not just the tennis world. This has been almost one of the biggest stories in the sports world in the last week or so. Because there's been such a soap opera element to it. And it feels like every day there's a new twist and a new turn. And then Djokovic comes out with a statement last night. And then a couple hours ago, um, Robert, thanks for the question, came the report that maybe the Spanish government is going to do an investigation into how Novak may have illegally come into Spain before going to Australia because he was training in Marbella, Spain, the southern part of the country, uh, before heading to Melbourne. Um, I thought Aaron Rodgers was the canary in the coal mine with the whole immunized vaccine thing. That pales in comparison to this. Um, here's the interesting part. Novak went over a week without touching a racket until he finally got on the practice court yesterday. The tournament's supposed to start Monday in Australia, so Sunday here. I don't know what kind, and look, Novak's in great shape, et cetera, but what kind of match shape may he be in if he gets to play the slam? This has turned into such a political deal and that has so many layers. For the longest time, the ATP Tour didn't have a word to say about it. Everyone's on eggshells over this tiptoeing around the issue um, while the Australian government deals with the issue. Tennis Australia wants Djokovic there. He's going to move the needle. He's going to sell tickets. Oh, wait, the Victorian government in Australia just announced today half capacity for their tournament because Omicron's taken on a life of its own. There are so many layers to this thing. Uh, the tennis world wants Djokovic to play. The Australian federal government is using Novak as a bit of a re-election uh, tool because they're going to be having an election, I think, in May. And Australia is the jurisdiction that's had the, the toughest restrictions. In the middle of all this is sport. So it's uh, it's a crazy one. Great question, Robert. Uh, I didn't think we were going to get into political debates across the board, but uh, I guess we're going to do another one here. Uh, I, I will let you read because I think as a sports information coordinator for a university, I'm, uh, I have my own feelings, but I have to be mindful of my words. Uh, yeah, Ron, Rash, is the Ontario provincial government's decision not to include university sport as elite a reflection of the broader public perspective on university sport? Ron, it's a good question. I don't know the answer specifically to that. I think it shows more an ignorance towards the Ontario government's understanding of what university sport is. I think that they just didn't take it into consideration. And one thing that we've learned about this provincial government is that once they make a decision, they dig their heels in and don't want to admit they're wrong about things. Um, so I think that's that, that all weighs into it. What we've seen from Doug Ford and especially Lisa McLeod, who has sport on her portfolio as a cabinet minister, is that they love posing with professional sports. They love posing with events that are chic and, and all those kinds of things, uh, like a Memorial Cup and a Grey Cup and that kind of deal. But it's just utter insanity that OUA athletes are not training and competing. And I go back to my original point, but it's just downright ignorance. Uh, you've obviously covered some, some not only obviously the, the, the professional level, but, you know, as you said, the Olympic aspect, but you said, I know when you've talked in the past, you said some of your, your favorite memories are covering university level sport and, you know, the, the, the events around it sort of thing. Um, you know, are, are there a few kind of stories or a few events that kind of still stick to mind from, 
uh, the university coverage uh, side of things? <clears throat> well, I remember doing a Western 81-3 to bowl game win over Acadia in Wolfville, Nova Scotia, so I'll never forget that one. Um, that was a that was a tough game to call. Um, yeah, there have been a bunch. There there have been there have been a number of them. Uh, mainly football and basketball. Those are the main sports I've called over the years. Um, it's it's the best because it means so much to everybody involved. It means so much to the the students, the student athletes, who almost exclusively won't be doing anything in as an athlete in sport, competitive sport, elite sport, um, after they're done at school. Everybody's in the same kind of stage of life. They're all into this. Um, it's not about money. It's not about contracts. It's not about ego. It is about the collective. Um, so it's tremendous, and it brings out some great atmospheres. Um, one of the last nationals I did, I think it was in 2019, I think, was when uh, Mac, sorry, McMaster, uh, won the women's basketball final eight. And the quarterfinals were Friday, and there were some fans there from Hamilton. And the semifinals were on Saturday, and there were more fans there from Hamilton. And then on Sunday, for the final, for the national championship final, the place was packed with people in maroon and, and all that deal. And they beat Laval in the final. And it it really was kind of the uniting of a community. And that's that's so much of what sport is, but especially university sport, that it's it's not just the athletes, it's not just the school, it's so many people who who have been part of this whole journey that are that are that are there for it, which I think is just awesome, and we need more of. Uh, and th I think that's been something that's come up in the past with either some other uh, guests and stuff like that. What are the things that need to be done, or can this whole um, you know kind of turn this narrative sort of thing of the fact that there is so much support for university level sport? There's you know there, there's people that are you know maybe outside of the student uh, athlete demographic and um, you know, coaches and so on and so forth, showing their support for your university sport. Is this an opportunity to kind of increase that profile and kind of add to the the attention aspect here? I don't know, Ryan. Or is it I, too tough? I, I hope it, I hope it can be. I just don't know. I, I I see. I I got into university sports when I was like ten years old, growing up in Truro, Nova Scotia. And St. Mary's had a quarterback, Chris Flynn, who was larger than life. He was Michael Vick and RG3 before Michael Vick and RG3 was a thing. And he was running around all over the place and firing the football 50, 60 yards on a rope. And I'm like, this is the coolest thing. And I can never understand. And, and Husky Stadium would get big crowds, but I can never understand why it wasn't bigger. And here we are 30 years later, and um, we're still wondering the same thing. Um, I don't know. I don't know. Uh, as we kind of look through, you know, some years we kind of say, you know, when you flip the script to the next year, some people kind of say, here's the story there. This could be the the emerging athletes or the, you know, the 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 people that we're going to need to know the names of sort of thing as we kind of get into the next year. Who are those few for you that people are kind of uh, need to be mindful of sort of thing as we get going here in 2022? Um, it's a good question. And I usually I'd have a list of Olympians for you, um, mm -hmm. but I'm not going to Beijing. And it's um, there's been no lead up to these Olympics. A lot of the qualifiers have been shut down. Um, so what I do know is it's an altogether new generation of them. So I'm pumped to see what what they're going to be all about. Um, we're starting to get to know Scotty Barnes a little bit from the Raptors. May very well end up being a final. Well, he should be a finalist for Rookie of the Year in the NBA. Um, but I don't know. That's a good question. I don't know. I think part of this whole thing of so many things being shut down is a big reason for that. 
it's it's an interesting aspect because usually you know there's the um you know the 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 kale mccarr story sort of thing is kale mccarr been the one of the, the the names that kind of are pushing in the nhl scheme just because of some of the highlights he's kind of thrown up in the last little bit and obviously bobby clark making a couple headlines there uh, kind of taking shots at uh, ron hextall in the last couple of days yeah none of the scouts want nolan patrick that one um <laughs> Yeah, I, absolutely. And what Kale McCarr does is he is able to score the kind of goals that go viral on social media, which is what every league wants right now, that most fans are consuming um, any kind of clip, any kind of moment that's not live on their, on their phone, you know, be it Insta or Twitter or mainly Insta. Um, Kale McCarr provides that for you. You know, I wanted to say, you know, I think every, like if you're a tennis fan, you know who Shapovalov and Felix Oje Aliasim are. We've known them for a little bit now. Both got to a semifinal of a Grand Slam last year. Layla got to a final. Um, what's so interesting right now about Canadian sports is that for the longest time, we were such a hockey baseball country. Now we're an everything country. Women's soccer just won gold at the Olympics. The men's soccer team is about to qualify for the World Cup for the first time since 1986. Um, Bianca wins the U.S. Open. Layla gets the U.S. Open final. Felix to the U.S. Open semi. Chapeau to the Wimbledon semifinal. Uh, we know what our Olympians are doing in the pool and on the track with Andre de Grasse. And on and on and on we can go. Uh, you know, I'm part of the uh, Canadian Athlete of the Year Committee every December. And Connor McDavid had a year for the ages. And it took like 40 minutes before his name was even mentioned because there are so many different athletes in so many different sports doing work right now. And that's, that's one of the coolest things to see is how as a sports country we have evolved from one or two sports to, to others. Uh, you mentioned tennis, getting a question in here from Juliana. Your opinion on Bianca Andreescu? She obviously has the immense talent, has had the injury element. How do you see her future as far as competitive tennis? You know, Juliana, that is such a great question and it is one of the biggest questions in the tennis tour, not just from a Canadian perspective, but going around, uh, you know, I was in Prague for the Billie Jean King Cup and there were so many people from so many different countries asking us as Canadians that very question. You know, Bianca had a 2019 for the ages. She got to the finals in Miami last year, but again, injuries have derailed her so much. Not encouraging to see her skip Australia with no real explanation given. Look, in a, in a one week or a two week tournament, Bianca is right there. She's right there in the conversation if she's playing well, if she's match fit, and if she's mentally there. Um, when she puts it together, she has shown, not just at the U.S. Open, not just at Indian Wells, not just at home in Toronto, but again in Miami too, she has shown that she can do it. Um, that's the challenge here, is that you got to do it every week. That's why what Serena did and what Nadal has done and what Federer has accomplished is just so remarkable that week after week, tournament after tournament, continent after continent, they're always there in the conversation at the end. And so Bianca's got to kind of put together something that's going to give her some kind of consistency and some kind of momentum. Can she regain it? I mean, nobody knows. But... That's what needs to happen, and we'll and we'll see if she has it in her. I'm, I'm Here's I am, I if I had Bianca stock, I'm not selling it right now. I'll tell you that much. I'm holding on to that sucker. Here's the the best part about talking to you, Arash. We go right from Bianca Andreescu to my next question is: Are you going to be in Dunedin, Florida, in a month's time from now? Oh man, I don't know. Probably not. Um, these idiots in baseball just continue to destroy the sport from within. Now, tomorrow, Major League Baseball, like they're having a lockout. Like It is a pandemic. It, it, it's a time where 
you're competing more and more to get people's eyeballs, and these geniuses have decided to to have a lockout again. Um, that baseball is going to present the players with some kind of core economic proposal, uh, whatever that means. I think, Ryan, that there's going to be a delay to spring training. There are some people who fear that games may be lost. I'm not going there yet. I think it's going to be a condensed spring training. Um, but it really feels like the owner's priority is more to screw over the players than it is to improve their own business. And that's what's wild to me. I uh, got a message in from Cam. Apparently he was reading my mind at the same time. He said, minus 30 degrees, let's talk baseball. Uh, loss of Robbie Ray versus gain of Gosman. And uh, uh, I love left, but I always played out how to get. Um, comparisons the middle infield on the radar. And what else do the Jays need to address? Um, okay, so Robbie Ray, they really liked, obviously, Cy Young, et cetera. But uh, management has loved Kevin Gosman for a long time. He's pitched in the AL East before, had some success with Baltimore coming up, has pitched in October before, just did for San Francisco against the Giants. And they feel that Gosman is a 1A to Jose Barrios, um, who's going to be the ace of this, of this team or ace of the rotation. So there's also more of a body of work. Um, can we just bring that question back up? There's more of a body of work with Gosman uh, because he's done it for so many years, whereas Robbie Ray, if you remember, in August-ish of 2020, was nearly out of baseball. His ERA was like 7 or 8 or something uh, before coming here and, and having some success. So... Uh, I think Ray's going to do well in Seattle. I can understand they just look at Gosman and say he's done it for a much longer sample size. We'll do that. Um, I was stunned that Marcus Simeon got $175 million um, playing every day, being the everyday second baseman, being a total pro, finishing third in AL MVP voting. Um, that's what uh, I, I thought he was going to get around 150. I thought he was going to California. Ends up getting 175, ends up in Texas. Uh, don't know who the everyday second baseman is going to be. Don't know who the everyday third baseman is going to be. Um, there's There's been some talk. Could Kevin Biggio be one of those, um, fill one of those holes? What I've been led to believe is that the Blue Jays really like Biggio but not to, do, not to play second and not to play third and not to play one position exclusively. They like the fact that he can play right field one day and second base one day, third base the other day. It's his versatility that makes him valuable. So what the Jays need to address is they need to get a legitimate backup catcher, probably a starting catcher, but I don't know if there's money for that. Uh, they need a third baseman. They need another middle infielder. And they need two bullpen arms. And one more starter. And obviously nothing can be done because you're in a lockout right now. But while a lot of the talk, Cam, had been about Ray and Simeon, to me the biggest question of all coming into this offseason was, can you get Jose Barrios locked up? Because remember, they gave away two of their top prospects, including a top five draft pick, Austin Martin, to get Barrios. He comes over, has pitched in October two or three times. Uh, he's 27, 28 years old. Uh, he's going to be a franchise cornerstone pitcher, and they did. So that that was one of the um, – that's a very long answer to some very good questions, Cam. So appreciate it, man. Uh, good friend. I, I always love using the good friend of the show line. So, there we go. You know, it's, it's, uh, good friend of the show, Patrick Houlette, also known as our one of our assistant coaches uh, for the men's hockey team. If you had to pick the best Canadian sporting event slash performance in 2020 on, what would it be? Uh, ba -ba -ba. Well, Patrick, I am not saying this because I'm on with uh, uh, host space out of London. But uh, Damian Warner's reaction to not winning the decathlon, but eclipsing the 9,000-point plateau, 
uh, in Tokyo, I'm still getting chills thinking about it. Um, I think it's that one. I really do. As, as magical as the Canadian women's soccer thing was, as out of nowhere as Layla reaching the U.S. Open final was, as incredible as Maggie McNeil's gold medal uh, swim was, um, Damian Warner is literally the best athlete in the world. And not only is he that, he just did something that like five or six people have ever done and did it at the Olympic Games. Um, so that was that was pretty damn cool. Could it happen to a nicer guy too? Like I, I saw the day that he uh, he won Lou Marsh. And, you know, some people would be, you know, you know up here, down here. Um, you've dealt with so many different athletes and so many different egos that go along with it. Just as easygoing, humble, like extremely compassionate about everything. It's like, could could these things happen to, uh, obviously, the, uh, we're lucky at the university. He literally trains in Thompson Arena, so we can sure. see him training. Um, but just... Could it happen to a nicer guy? You, you mentioned you're on that committee to make the selection sort of thing. Was that, um, you know, you, I know it wasn't unanimous, but it was, had to be pretty, obviously a pretty good eclipsing number of exactly. It was that why it was. Yeah, well, it's not why it was. Uh, it certainly mm -hmm. didn't hurt. Here's what's interesting. We're on the committee and we discuss and we debate and we identify. Um, but we, and then we vote secret ballot, we just email them in, and then we don't get the results um, unless it is unanimous. Um, I interviewed Warner that night, the night he was named the Athlete of the Year. And one of the things he said was, and, and, I'm, and I'm not quoting him directly, but he almost said like how awkward he felt by all the attention. Um, that's not like in a, beat your chest, me, 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 look at me environment we now live in. That's not Damian Warner at all. And I think there's a little bit of appreciation from a lot of Canadians about that. Um, but that said, the dude wants to go to schools and he wants to go talk to kids and he wants to inspire them too. And you're just like, really? Are you, are you checking off every box that you're supposed to right now? Because good for you for doing it. Uh, my hope is that corporate Canada is going to reach out to Damian Warner and Damian Warner's representatives and have Warner come and speak to companies and, about leadership and about goal setting and about overcoming adversity and finding solutions to problems. Because he's had to deal with all of those things just in the last four or five years um, because of COVID and everything else. So uh, he has an incredible message. He's an incredible athlete. He's an amazing Canadian. And I hope he can share his stories, not only to the next generation, but also to many who are in leadership roles um, in offices and in companies all across the country. Uh, well, Arash, I have my uh, my standard hour, and I know you've been up at uh, six thirty with uh, Six Arrow and finishing it with me. And I I hope you don't have to do too many more things today. And I'm sure there's probably another five thirty hit tomorrow or something along the lines that you have to get to. So I I, I say thank you as always, and I, I look forward to our conversation in season three. Um, let me see where where's Mr. Singer? There he is. Uh, I will I will pass it back over to Clark uh, Arash as always. Thank you very much. Uh, I, w I did not mention the Green Bay Packers until now. Until now. Until now. I beat you two over there in Rogers. So there you go. Ryan, good to see you, bro. Thanks again, man. Thank you, sir. Arash, before I, uh, I, I shut her down for the evening, I did have one other question from a, uh -oh. a viewer who, no, who, who I guess couldn't get in on the chat. They, they, had, they had asked, uh, they wanted to know, you know, you, you have mentioned so many wonderful sporting events and moments in the last couple of hot stoves you've been on with us, you know, the chills you've received in, in different venues. Like, do you have a highlight of your career? I know that's probably a tough question. You mentioned the Damian Warner chills when he broke the record. You know, I think you were there for the Jose Bautista bat flip. Like, do you have a, a highlight of your career you can identify? 
Yeah, I would say there's two, Clark. Um, one was London 2012, walking to Olympic Stadium uh, three, four hours before the opening ceremony. Uh, covering that opening ceremony, I was down um, trackside to interview some of the athletes as they were coming and going, the Canadian athletes. And just thinking to myself, man, I'm at an Olympic Games. I'm going to be involved in the opening ceremony coverage. The entire world is watching this, and I'm going to be there for that. That was that was definitely one. The other is, as a tennis guy, um, I was a really, really shitty player um, growing up. And I always thought Wimbledon was the happiest place on earth. And I got to Wimbledon for a Roger Federer, Novak Djokovic center court final one year. Um, I think that was the year Eugenie Bouchard also got to the final. Uh, that's why I was there covering it. Um, but being at center court for uh, the, the ladies and the gentlemen's final on the final Sunday of the fortnight, um, those were those were probably two of the real pinch me moments I've had in my career. Well, Arash, I, I want to thank you very, very much for again, taking a, a bit more than an hour out of your uh, incredibly busy schedule to join us and, and help us with the, the virtual hot stove again this year. You're a, you're a, a great man, a very, very genuine professional, uh, a great storyteller. We, we always love listening to, to you, whether it's tonight or on Sportsnet or uh, on the radio, uh, really appreciate you um, coming on board. I'll message you tomorrow about a date for for next year. No, I, I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. And and He's so not. thank you, Rash. <laughs> and, and and Ryan, you're 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 amazing. You do a great job. Thanks again for uh, helping us out tonight. And to all our our friends and alumni of Mustang Hockey, uh, thanks for joining us for episode three this year. Coming up in mid-February will be our own uh, David Roy, our uh, Mustang hockey alumni who has some great stories, former professional hockey coach, played here at Western and has an amazing uh, tsunami story that he was involved in that uh, he'll share with us. So we're just trying to tidy up the date uh, for that, given we're, we're awaiting our final uh, marching orders on our schedule for February once the I don't know, the, the third lockdown end. So thanks, everybody, and uh, thanks for supporting Mustang Hockey. Cheers.